Yeah, someone reminded me recently of of a quote by Teddy Roosevelt on decision making, and he said, "Your first choice is to make the right decision. Your second choice is to make the wrong decision, and the third choice is to make no decision. But do them in that in that order. Something like that, right?" Boy, that I agree with that. Nothing throws wrenches in the gears like not making a decision. Exactly. Yeah. It's so frustrating for people when they can't get decisions made by the decision makers. <laughs> if that's if that's your job, then I, I agree completely with that quote. You got to make a decision. Try your best to make the right decision. If it's the wrong decision, reverse it as quickly as you can. Exactly. And that's where the conversation went afterwards. It's like, you can always reverse a wrong decision, but not making a decision is the worst thing you can do. <laughs> You're listening to RevOps Champions, a podcast created for B2B leaders to help you align your people, streamline your processes, trust your data, and leverage technology in order to grow your business. We're your hosts, Brendan Denewell, CEO and co-founder of Dynamico. And Amy Weaver, Dynamico's marketing director. David, thanks so much for joining us today on the RevOps Champions podcast. I've been looking forward to this conversation now for, for a few weeks. I think our audience, specifically sort of manufacturing and, and engineering audience, are really going to learn a lot from your years of, actually your decades of leadership, engineering, and manufacturing experience. So thanks so much for being here with us. My pleasure, Brendan. Thank you. David, let's start. Will you just briefly talk a little bit about dry steam? Who is Dry Steam? What is Dry Steam? Dry Steam is a wonderful small manufacturing firm here in Minnesota, in Eden Prairie, actually. Our core product and our core competency is what we call it's humidification. It's commercial humidification. So these are humidifiers that are humidifying spaces like museums, hospitals, operating rooms, if needed, processes that need humidification. For instance, wood based manufacturing. Facilities often need humidification. So uh -huh. humidifiers of all shapes and sizes, but not for the home for larger applications. We call it commercial. Commercial. And, and it sounds like some sort of fairly specialized, when you talk about hospitals and museums, it's, it's not just any commercial. It's pretty specific use cases. It is. Our equipment, when you buy a humidifier for a home, you buy it because you want to. If you're buying dry steam, humidifier, it's either because you need to dissatisfy building codes or you need uh -huh. to improve your process or for a museum, for example, you need to, to protect the artifacts that are in the museum. So there's right. usually a good, strong case for using the humidifier. It makes the applications a little more specialized and in some case, critical type applications as well. And when you say applications, you're talking about like the overall HVAC system that it's attached to. Exactly. Typically, right. we are incorporated one way or another into the heating, ventilation, air conditioning system of the existing building or the new building. Okay. So it's essentially a sort of a custom addition, or is it all built custom together? Typically, it really depends upon the application, Brendan. Our equipment that can reside in other people's equipment, and what I mean by that specifically is the steam that our equipment generates might be released inside an air handler. An air handler is a big piece of equipment that serves conditioned air to a particular space. Uh -huh. We also might have equipment that delivers humidity directly to the space as a, and kind of outside the, the envelope of the air handler itself. It really uh -huh. depends upon the application. Yeah. And in, in that example, the air handler could be from any other brand or manufacturer. Yeah, absolutely. We have OEM air handling manufacturers all over the country that use our equipment inside their equipment. Uh -huh. But again, it might be used separately elsewhere in the system. Yeah, cool. Well, that, that's that's definitely helpful and gives us all like you know better insight into exactly where the product is and can be used. Yeah. So as we are getting crazily enough, we're getting ready to wrap up 2024, and we're all looking forward to 2025. What what are you most excited about? We see our industry recovering. Actually, Brendan, that that's really exciting to us. We've had a a slow growth year. Dry steam has been growing nicely over the last few years. We got a big bump during COVID. Uh -huh. This year has been a really slow growth year. We have a lot of positive indicators that next year, the industries that drive our business, the markets that drive our business are going to be stronger. Uh -huh. We're really excited about that. We really think it's going to be a great year. Excellent. And then what do you see as 
some of the the biggest potential headwinds to you know let's say the manufacturing slash engineering industries coming up for us elevated interest rates have hurt our business because it stopped speculative building it stopped some of the what we call RRI building build people's expanding uh their operations based on a return on investment, and that return on investment might be harder to get since interest rates are higher. Mm -hmm. So that has suppressed business a bit. The must-have applications like hospitals and whatnot has remained strong. Mm -hmm. But some of the ROI work, we think will come back as interest rates come down. So I was talking to an a investment banker just yesterday, and they're expecting the Fed to drop interest rates maybe three to four times over the next six months. And that certainly will, will help our business. Yeah. Pretty direct and pretty quickly. Yeah. And I think it's, it's, you know, interest rates have obviously been a big factor for a lot of industries. It seems to have been a, a slow year in a lot of industries for, for that reason, or at least that was part of the reason. Do you see any other sort of challenges or headwinds ahead? We are in the middle of significant changes in our industry due to Mega trends, for lack of a better term, uh, sustainability, electrification, decarbonization. I'll give you a great example. We we build a humidifier that is that operates by boiling water by burning natural gas. Uh -huh. And Belgium used to be one of our biggest markets for that. Oddly enough, uh -huh. this year we've sold zero units in Belgium. They moved away from gas uh -huh. uh, to electrification. So a challenge for us is to move with the market, have the products and services and features needed uh, to, to still satisfy the humidity demand, you know, the need for humidity, but doing mm -hmm. it in a way that meets people's desires based on these megatrends. Uh, Got to be efficient and not be directly burning fossil fuel. Right. So that's it's caused product development, which is great. We've got some pretty interesting products, one I hope to release next year. Mm -hmm. In answer to these trends. So these trends are conflicting, though, Brendan, because also water use is, is of big concern in many parts of our country and parts of our country that use a lot of humidification. The desert southwest, for example, mm -hmm. need humidification and a lot of the processes that exist there. For example, we just got a, a very large order, $100,000 order for a paint booth uh, for one of the electric car manufacturers that are located in the desert southwest. Mm -hmm. But this takes a lot of water, which conflicts with the, you know, the desire to conserve water in those territories. So there's trends moving both ways, driving our business different directions, but causing maybe some headwinds. But they almost always present an opportunity for us to innovate a little bit and come up with new solutions to answer new problems. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. It's, you know, the Chinese character for crisis and opportunity are the same character, right? Because they're typically... The, you know, oh, that's crisis. interesting. That's yeah. It. So, because crisis and opportunity are typically two sides of the same coin, you know. So, as soon as you have a, a crisis, there's a need to innovate, which then becomes the opportunity if you're able to 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 do the innovation. Yeah. Great way to look at it. And some of what's happening right now, I mentioned a new product that we hope to release. We we wouldn't have really considered this product had it not been for these trends that we're trying to answer. Mm -hmm. And now we've got a product that we think might be fairly significantly industry changing if we can perfect it and get it to the market. So, yeah, a crisis of, in one sort, this market change is creating what we hope a real opportunity for Christ. Yeah, that's really cool. So thinking back, you know, you've had a, a really good career already, and I know you're only halfway there. <laughs> uh, I wish, Brendan. <laughs> But thinking back, you know, what were the key elements in, in your experience that you saw teams that helped them scale more efficiently than others? When I say teams, you know, business teams. I've spent most of my career, Brendan, in niche markets within the HVAC industry. And it's a great place to be. But I've learned a few things along the way that have helped us, I think, be better at, at scaling and growing. Years ago, when I first got into the HVAC industry, I was uh, part owner of a small business building, big custom air handler, like we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. The company was owned by three engineers. We love to engineer. <laughs> got great satisfaction out of engineering. And if a uh, customer called, uh, no matter what they said, we'd say, yep, we can do it. And we'd start from a, a white sheet of paper and we'd design something completely new and we'd 
try to build it and ship it and collect on it profitably. And it worked. But what we found is you reached a ceiling. That that mode of operation would create a nice little profitable manufacturing firm, but you hit a ceiling. that It just didn't work after a while. Right. What we've learned over the years is, particularly in these niche markets where we want to serve the customer with exactly the right product, for their application and solve the problems that they need solved. But we've transitioned really to thinking about being configurable and not custom. So we can still change our products, but it's to meet a consumer, a customer's need. But the change is within some boundaries. And the boundaries often are set by our digital tools. We have, uh, we develop selection and, and pricing software where we can change features, offer our customers options to almost feel custom, but it's really not custom because the our business tools can create bills of materials and job listings and things like that to build the equipment efficiently. Uh-huh. And then those tools can be used to scale the sales and marketing. And, and then it's a lot easier to grow the business without, without a ceiling. Sure. We ran into when we were totally custom. So that's probably been over the decades, one of the biggest shifts mm-hmm. is this. Sticking with a flexible business process or or proposition to our customer base, Uh but it's configurable. It's not custom. Yeah. So it's, I mean, I think you, you, you kind of, in the end, I I like where you went with process because, you know, you have processes, you know, whatever, a lot of our audience are, you know, EOS companies. So they would be, they would talk about the proven process on the customer facing side and then core processes on the, on the back end. We use another framework where you talk about front stage processes and backstage processes, but ultimately it's, you know, it's the processes, the end to end processes in your business, right? That of course, you're always trying to make more efficient. So that makes total sense the way that you explained it. Of course, it starts with, in the example you gave three people who just happen to be smart engineers, which of course, without them, you couldn't then start thinking about the processes. But then you also learn that there's these things called sales and marketing, and those people know what they're talking about, too. And you listen to them. and <laughs> Right. Yeah. Uh, things work out a little bit better. Yeah. Although, you know, like like a lot of our, our architecture and engineering clients will tell us that, you know, the, the specific people, the engineers working in these companies will tell us that they do, they love what they do so much that they would do it for free if someone would just pay their rent and their their kids' tuition, you know. Yeah, well, I learned pretty early on, right out of college, I started a business to sell a new product and learned pretty quickly that you can invent the greatest product in your own mind, but if nobody wants to buy it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You got to have a market, you got to serve the market. Yeah, which is which is why you've been so successful. Oh, uh, yeah, I hope so. I hope. Because, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like everything in business. You know, we, we, we talk a lot about how business is a team sport and pick your favorite sport. I mean, Basketball is an easy one because there are only five players on the court at any one time, but those five players have at least, be- between the five of them, they have at least two or three very distinct skills. You know, they're not, they're not all doing the same thing. And that's what you need to be successful, whether it's on a basketball court or in a business. Couldn't agree more, Brendan. We we talk at Dry's team, we'll switch gears here a little bit. We talk about Dry's team and people and how important it is. And a lot of companies will tell you that people are their most important assets, asset, but they might not truly act that way and behave that way. We try hard at Dry Steam to walk that talk. People here are our most important asset, and we, we try to act accordingly and treat people accordingly. And I don't believe that we could be successful doing this highly configurable product, process-driven, engineering-driven type circumstance. We wouldn't be successful if it wasn't for the great people we have here. Guided, yeah. by, guided by a strategy and curbed and directed by a process. Absolutely. Yeah, we we hear that all the time, you know, whether it's on the podcast or just in our day-to-day conversations. And the way we kind of think about it now is that people are kind of table stakes. So if like from our perspective, when we're looking to work with a, with a, a, a new client company, if they don't have the people thing figured out Anything that we can do from a data and technology perspective is going to be, you know, really, really hard for us to do and very hard for them to be successful at if they haven't figured out the people piece of the puzzle, you know? Yeah, so true. That's so true. Yeah. And of course, 
that also means that we don't have to worry too much about that. I mean, except for where we come in when the people piece is just the, the change management component, which of course is is critical when you're introducing you know new technology. Yeah. So the the training is the, and the change management are the two things that we really touch the most. And again, it helps a lot if you have you know good people, good culture, and alignment between those people to to start off with. Another, I think, another piece of our secret sauce is we're an ISO company. We're ISO certified. We mm. keep certification active. Yeah. But in the past, I've been involved with companies that are ISO certified. But you find out that it, they're ISO certified in order to sell into Europe or worldwide or some other company country that looks for ISO certification, not necessarily because they want to be or actively use it. Mm-hmm. Our ISO process drives the business. Even you mentioned change and change management. We have ISO processes for change management. You know, what do we do uh, in circumstances of change? And it's part of our process. It's documented. It's followed. We get audited by ISO companies to, to maintain our, our, our registration. And it matters, even all the way down to change management, which a lot of people wouldn't associate with ISO. But that's a process, too, and it can be followed. Absolutely. And, it's, and we believe... That change management is going to be an even bigger deal than it has been for the last 10 years and the 20 years. With the changes in just technology on a macro scale right now, we believe change management is going to be that much more important. So I think you're one step ahead. I agree with that. And also, the other, another dynamic is we've embraced the, the hybrid workspace and change management becomes a, a really solid change management process that's followed. You can't rely on word of mouth and somebody hearing something over a cubicle and, and spreading the information that way. Right. So it, it is, it's critical. Yeah. Yeah. That's really. And how long has Dry's team had the ISO certification and process in place? Oh boy. Decades. Okay. So it's been a long time. 15 or 20 years. Yeah, that's really interesting because we were talking about that this morning. You know, some of the the reasons and differences about why you would go down the ISO certification track versus, like, in our industry where we're we're touching a lot of data inside the technology platforms of our clients. Oh, sure. Is the so the other one is is SOC two, just from a like a security and safety perspective. And it's interesting to start seeing the arguments form for both, and then it, it becomes a thing of like, well, which one seems more critical? You know, ult- and ultimately, ISO is far more comprehensive. But again, for this, the world that we're getting ourselves into here, SOC two is becoming more and more of a of a necessary evil for the lack of a pick your tool. For instance, ERPs. There's a lot of ERPs out there. For any given circumstance, there's probably a few little work. Pick one. But then implement it, use it in a disciplined manner, maintain it, uh, make it part of your process. You know, we use ISO here. Uh-huh. That's one tool. Yep. It's not the only tool, but none of these tools are going to work if you don't stick with them, use them properly, set them properly up properly, and have a culture of using them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that that seems to be in a that trend. I don't know. I haven't figured out exactly what's causing it yet, but this whole trend around using operating systems and frameworks it just seems there's so many more businesses talking about it now than than they were a year ago you know with the speed of change and, and now that you know the next big change wave rolling over us is artificial intelligence if you don't have these things documented your process documented and a system to work with them it can become pretty chaotic pretty quickly your your business can become very chaotic quickly yeah, I mean, I'm not surprised you mentioned that because I know, I know you're also, you know, t- you know, from a tech perspective, you're you're always kind of thinking, you know, you're using like personal technology sooner than I am, and I'm <laughs> supposedly closer to technology than you are. But somewhat of an early adopter on a lot of these things, just just out of curiosity, I, I love seeing how they work. Yeah, and but one of the things you know we've been digging into AI because. So AI is already built into the products that we implement for our our clients, like HubSpot, for example. But we also feel like a lot of our clients and, and prospective clients, just businesses out there, they want to know how much, how many calories to invest in AI. It's a really tricky question. And one of the things we've we we just found out a few weeks ago, as we were kind of we were putting together a boot camp or a sort of a four week workshop series. 
just to try and help companies figure out how to how to adopt AI specifically in their on the revenue side of the business across marketing, sales, and customer yeah. service. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the the, the bit we so, so we try to break it down into like what do we start with, and the, and we very quickly got to well, what you need to start with is your readiness for AI. In other words, are you ready to actually even start using AI, or what do you need to do to start using AI? Then we broke that down further and said, okay, well, so what is the first step for AI readiness? And we realized, well, the first step is you have to have good, clean, organized data. Exactly. And of course, if you don't have that, then don't even waste any calories on thinking about AI. The ex- the experiments that we're running on how to take advantage of artificial intelligence are showing us that one of the key things we can do is only feed the transformer good data instead of letting go all over the world to, to to mine data, however these systems do it, yeah, we constrain the data set that the system can see, that the transformer can see. And what we've experienced then is the answers are much more accurate, just for example. But mm-hmm. the sales tools, our, head are, it, our heads are spinning because there's so many opportunities to use this, this new technology. They are, yeah. And, and again, and you know, on the marketing, sales, and customer service side, so one of my colleagues at the big HubSpot event last month in, in Boston, she did a, a talk on all around clean data. And the, the title of the talk was Garbage In, Garbage Out. Right. Because again, because we've we've seen that firsthand. And this has happened, this has been the case for the last hundred or more years. That whenever you introduce new technology, it'll put a spotlight on what you're doing, whether it's good or bad. So if you're in this case, if your data is bad, it's going to get worse by adding AI. Yeah. <laughs> and if it's good, it's going to get better by using AI. So AI will give you a really, really quick conduit to deliver bad information to your customers uh, is, is the danger. Exactly. But the opportunity to do you know, just the opposite, deliver really useful information almost immediately, what a huge opportunity that is. Yeah. Yeah, and, and we actually talk quite a lot, you know, on on the podcast, and of course, just every other day about data and technology, which of course is what we work with every day. How for businesses it can be either an asset or a liability, which is essentially what we're talking about now, right? Because the same as you have on the data side, you have the same thing on the technology side, where we find often when we when we go into working with a company for the first time that they're they have technology that they haven't used in a year or more, but they're still paying for it because they think somebody is using it somewhere. Oh, interesting. So again, it's just it's just cleaning up. And it's a very natural thing. We could see why it happened. Uh, but again, you still want to help and businesses still want to get this figured out. Right. It's because technology has been growing and moving so fast that, you know, so five years ago, if someone in some department found a, a specific use case tool that could solve a problem that they needed, and they needed it then. It made sense that they got they went and got it. But then they've two years ago they got another tool which did some other things, but also that. But they still are trying to use both. Well, uh, honestly, we suffered from the same issue when I got here. And but again, but in our processes, nobody can buy any software without IT's approval. Very simple process. IT stays on top of every every uh, piece of IT equipment and software that we buy. Otherwise, you're right. You you end up with a whole bunch of tools that you may or may not be using. Right. Can you think of any examples in your experience of where data or technology has been either a liability or an asset in a business? Well, our business, my experience is that Dry's team, we're, you know, we're not that big a business, 130 people. I think we make better use of data than any other company I've seen our size and a lot of companies larger. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And it largely is because we have creative and curious IT department, to be honest, Brendan. Ah. It emanated from them. They learned to link our systems together. Our ERP can talk to our CRM, can talk to our this and can talk to our that. They figured this out on their own initiative, started delivering useful, actionable data and then that started to snowball. People in the organization started seeing what was possible mm. in terms of data and use of data, uh, and it just snowballed. And, and it's created an unbelievably productive office here. That's awesome. We might have 
five or six percent more headcount than we did eight years ago, and revenues almost doubled. Wow. And a lot of it is credited to what IT has done with all sorts of automation and use of data. Mm-hmm. And it, it really involves having bright, curious people and then give them the the latitude to try some new things. And if they don't work, that's okay. We'll try something else. But it has taken off and it's been so beneficial to our business. Mm-hmm. So it's always interesting when you, in the, in the case of a, in a manufacturing business, which of course, like in a professional services business like ourselves or a lot of our, our clients who are also in professional services, the, what the IT department in this case, and in, in, many, of, in many of the companies that we work with, they have a, a RevOps department, which is separate from the IT department. Does your IT department, are they looking at the data and technology stacks for the revenue team, the ERP, in other words, the back office and production side? So they, they take care of everything, all IT and data needs? They do. We, our IT department takes care of all of that. However, our IT department is headed by a gentleman more or less self-taught in IT, educated as a marketing person and did spend a lot of time in sales. So the head of our IT department is, you know, keenly aware that the importance of sales and marketing. So then so much energy and effort goes into how to make our IT systems beneficial to growing top line, to be quite honest. that's It's not all just about reporting after the fact or uh, making sure the internet's still running. Mm -hmm. They're also providing us tools and ideas for new tools to help us grow. Slicing and dicing data so that we understand Mm -hmm. our markets or the applications we're selling to, to creating tools, applications, maybe a a phone app, for example, to help price. But I think we're we're fortunate to have a, a very curious and intelligent marketing and sales type heading our IT department. Yeah. So, and in fact, as you're explaining that, and you're right, it, that is amazing that, that you have that resource in-house. It's quite unique, I believe. And it's probably because, you know, obviously the company's been around for a long time and, and there was no reason to change the name of that department. But to me, it sounds like a RevOps department. Yeah. It just doesn't make sense to change the name just because you have smart people in there who have a lot of marketing and, you know, marketing ops, sales ops, and data and technology experience, which is today... And we see it all the time where we start working with with companies who also don't have a RevOps department, but then six months later, suddenly there's a director or a, v, or a VP of, of RevOps because, again, they realized it was time to change how they were doing things internally. But not that you really need to change the titles as long as, as, long as they're getting the job done. That's the most important thing. I never really thought of it that way, Brendan, but I think you're, I think you're right. Beyond our people, I think the second most important sales tool we have, it, it's a piece of software. It's, it's product configuration and pricing software. And this same department that makes sure my PC lights up in the morning and the internet's running and the phones are ringing, they also manage the development of that, that tool, that sales tool, which is, you know, I talked a little bit earlier about constraining customization to become configurable. That's what this tool does. Mm-hmm. It resides within IT, but it's it's vital to our sales and marketing effort. And IT works closely with sales and marketing and, and the, all of their customers and stakeholders to make sure the tool works correctly. So you're right. It, it, that is how you, how you described it is correct. I never thought of it that way. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I just, I mean, it obviously it just clicked as you were explaining it for me too. But, you know, you mentioned how that's been so powerful driving top line for you. But you also said that you've essentially added five or six people and you've doubled your revenue. So clearly the the, the bottom line effect is pretty incredible as well. Yeah, it has been. Yeah. It has been. We financially very strong. And as if you can continue to grow, but you operate within a, a system that scales without adding a whole lot more people or other expensive capital investments. Yeah, it's it's very beneficial, bottom line. No doubt about that. So this is really, really interesting. So David, do you think you could kind of break down in a little more detail? So for, the, for folks listening who are leading companies, whether it's manufacturing company or, or any other business who don't 
have the, the luxury or or it's not really luxury, it's you know, who just don't have what you have as far as having this incredible IT team that essentially makes your business more and more efficient and effective pretty much it sounds like every day or every month. How would you recommend somebody goes about creating what that team does? Well, it, it goes back to people, Brendan. You got to you got to find somebody, and if and if it's if it's a new effort from scratch, you got to find somebody that can germinate this. And if maybe it's somebody that's out of the technology world, but understands and has an appreciation for sales and marketing, or maybe it's like in our case where it's somebody who comes out of sales and marketing but has a a deep willing a willingness and ability and aptitude to learn the technology side but certainly our the way we've scaled this business and at the same time not hired as many people a lot of that is due to our our IT systems honestly yeah. the tools that we use mm-hmm. that allow us to configure the process products that allow those bills materials and then the manufacturing instructions to be generated automatically allows the factory to just produce the equipment and we don't need a lot of headcount to prepare that for the factory. Our software does it. Yeah. So if you, I guess if you, and this might've already been happening before you, because you've been there for almost eight years now, is it? Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. So a lot of this might've already been happening before you got there. Uh, And if that's the case, I mean, what do you think there had to be permission for for this team to do what they're doing, right? So in other words, which came from somebody had the strategy or the or the forward thinking to say, we have to better use technology in all aspects of our business to be more efficient and effective every quarter and every year. Yeah, when I when I arrived here, what I found was a really nice business operating very well, but I also found that an incredible, incredible amount of data. For example, we'd been on an ERP for decades, and our customer service records are all on ERP. All of our orders, all our data is in this piece of software, in the database that's associated with this piece of software. Mm -hmm. Why not use it? What can we glean from it? And it starts easy. You know, who are our customers? Why are they ordering? How often do they order? Do they reorder? Where are they from? And then what that did, I think, was those types of questions led to me personally wanting reports, but I don't want paper reports and I don't want reports that I have to print out and I don't want reports. I don't even want reports that I have to be sitting in my office to get. Uh-huh. Well, how do you do that? Well, you you leverage your, your cloud-based IT systems. And I think then the, the momentum started, that flywheel started, you know, the flywheel analogy and then it mm-hmm. really caught fire and then you start seeing the value in mining this data and using it not again not just for reporting but to help you make decisions and to and data that can be acted on in a way that helps your business and then what happened was a, a young man that mostly worked on our servers figured out how to do some programming within a tool that we use called zoho and he got that tool to connect with our ERP, and then we could see the possibilities and then built up a little bit of critical mass and then it exploded. And everybody in the business knows that if they need data, they can get it and they can get it delivered in a, an easy fashion. And once we create that delivery vehicle or report of some type, we don't have to mess around with it again. Yeah, that is so powerful. Usually productive. Yeah, yeah. Can you think of any reason why any business would not want to do that? Well, I think the old excuse or or not an excuse, the old reason was it was so darn expensive, but that's just not the case anymore. A lot Mm -hmm. of these tools, particularly these cloud-based tools, they cost a fraction of what they, to use what they would have 20 years ago or 10 years ago. Um, Companies our size can get incredible tools uh, at a reasonable price that with fantastic ROI when you look at what it does for your business. So I think the old excuse was two things, people and money. You got to get the people. Can't solve that one for you. Uh, yeah. You got to find the right people and you got to give them, you got to have enough confidence. Pick people that you have confidence in to give them a little bit of leeway to go see what they can create and then use these affordable tools and and get started. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was in a conference yesterday and there was a, a lot of talk around AI and one of the people in the in the group was like, well, 
if I said to you, you could, you know, 100x, so we were having a lot of 10x type conversations, like how do you 10x yeah. your, your life and your business? And someone said, well, if you could 100x your business at zero cost, does that sound like a good proposition to you? Which is essentially what you just said. Yeah, it seems like. It's, <laughs> you know, the ROI is, whatever it is, it's, it's, it's very, very, very attractive. And the cost is, I mean, whether it's even even a thousand bucks a month, that is pretty much zero, right? When you when you look at the upside for a business that can generate fifty or a hundred or two hundred or four hundred million dollars more, minuscule, and you pay for it immediately. Uh, and these tools really are affordable, and they really do matter. Yeah, yeah, and I guess the the other thing that we that we've heard a lot here from from other folks who who've been on both sides of implementing technology, both successfully and failed implementations. One of the other, I think, pieces of advice that we've we've had on the show multiple times, I think, which is worth worth mentioning is, and I know for engineers like you and 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 many, many other engineers listening, this is how you think. But those of us who are not engineers, who tend to you know, you get distracted by things like shiny object syndrome, it's like, you know, <laughs> guilty. It's just mapping this all out manually. And I would so, so again, what are the processes we're we're trying to ensure are correct? Map them all out manually, whether it's a marketing process, a sales process, whatever it is, or you or the process from handing off from marketing to sales or sales to customer service. Do it all manually. And then once you have the manual version, look at it and say, well, okay, so where is their technology that can improve these these processes, whether it's a, a one-step process or a three-step process, then figure out, and eventually you'll see, okay, well, there's enough of a reason to have one piece of technology or, or a more comprehensive technology that'll be able to do multiple and tie them all together in one unified system. So yeah, it's... I agree with that. We have a I mean, there's a piece of software. It's called uh, Visio. It's I, I believe it's mostly intended yeah. for flowcharting, but that word is used around here as a noun and as a verb. And because, like you just mentioned, we have a new process or or envisioning processes like that, then we'll go and and we'll do a Visio. Do and a Visio, yeah. Flow, and it's kind of manual, and it's on a piece of paper, but it flowcharts. And then from there, we can get a visual representation of what we're trying to accomplish, and then we can go find a tool or a process to accomplish it. But, yeah, yeah, you're right. Those visualization tools are very, very right. They really help helpful. And of course, Visio has a great name. If you so, it, it makes sense that it becomes right. a, 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 a verb. But you can actually right. let's go and Visio something versus visualize something. Yeah, yeah, very cool. David, like thinking back, I mean, you talked you know earlier on about you know this year has been tough for a lot of businesses. But going further back, can you think back at another, another time where there were some challenges or, or big, hard decisions that you needed to make that actually, in the end, turned out okay, but at the time didn't seem all that attractive? Yeah, of course you run into those. If you're leading businesses, that stuff's going to happen. Uh, there's the usual stuff like downturns in the economy, but... Uh... You know, some of the more difficult decisions I made over the years, moving a factory, even even moving, well, when I'm particularly thinking of, we moved it uh, 30 miles. But the impact that that has on people's lives, uh -huh. particularly in the area that we were in, yeah, those are tough decisions to make. You try to do what's best for the people in the business. You uh, see all sides, but yeah, they come up. You got to manage through them. Uh, you can't be afraid to make a decision, but you don't want to make a a hasty decision, and you want to make sure that one way or another that what you're doing is in the best long-term interests of the people of your business, because again, it boils down to they are our most important asset. So always try to keep that in front and center. What's what's best for the people long-term? Yeah. We'll always end up being best for the business. That doesn't mean you you just give stuff away. That's that's not the best long-term uh, interest of the company, which in turn wouldn't be the best long-term interest of the people. But hmm. always try to consider that in every difficult decision that we're making. Yeah, someone reminded me recently of of a quote by Teddy Roosevelt on decision making, and he said, "Your first choice is to make the right decision. Your second choice is to make." The wrong decision and the third choice is to make no decision but do them in that in that order something like that right 
Boy, that I agree with that. Nothing throws wrenches in the gears like not making a decision. Exactly. Yeah. It's so frustrating for people when they can't get decisions made by the decision makers. <laughs> if that's if that's your job, then I, I agree completely with that quote. You got to make a decision. Try your best to make the right decision. If it's the wrong decision, reverse it as quickly as you can. Exactly. Exactly. That's And that's where the conversation went afterwards. It's like, you can always reverse a wrong decision. Yeah. But not making a decision is the worst thing you can do. <laughs> we try to... We try to foster an attitude around here, kill it quickly. We want to try a new idea. Let's let's try it. You know, within yeah. within reason, of course, and and after good thought, but try it. But if it doesn't work, have enough self confidence to kill it. Yeah, yeah. And admit it didn't work, and don't take that personally. Yeah, you've made a decision. <laughs> yeah, and you're going to learn something from it too. Oh, true. Right. Yeah, you'll yeah. learn. That's yeah, always true. You'll learn even in failure. You'll learn something. Absolutely. Sometimes you learn more from failure than... Yeah, I bet you're right. Yeah, yeah. I suppose yeah. you're right with that. Yeah. So, David, as we wrap up here, what advice would you give to the folks listening, you know, whether they're in the manufacturing industry or, or not? What are the things that, that you're thinking about that you think might be valuable to others? Well, interestingly enough, today, mostly my day has been filled with trying to figure out how to create careers for some really good people we have in this business and directing that career in a manner that helps the business. So aligning career development with uh, where the business is going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Most of my meetings today have been about that topic. And I honestly can't think of a better topic to tackle. The problem we have right now is so many good people that we have to try to figure out how to accommodate with uh, productive and satisfying careers. So I, you know, I'll go back to what I said. It's it's the people. Take take care of your people. Get the right people. Mm -hmm. Treat them right. Give them some latitude to try new things. Give them some permission to make a few mistakes. It doesn't matter what kind of business you're running. If that's you get the right people there, it's going to work. Yeah. So it's again, if you have the right leadership, like you are, and it's really it's about that the mentoring and and coaching of of your people, right? Because what, what can be more valuable than that? And what I know is that, like, as my kids call it, you know, in the 1900s, they used to talk about management in businesses, but now we talk about coaching and mentoring, you know, which is really, that. And in, if people haven't figured that one out yet, that... I like that change of, of language. Yeah. Well, and you're obviously, and you obviously get it naturally, because that's, like you said, that's what you've been doing all day. So Yeah, we have been. But I am also in a really fortunate position where we've got so many wonderful people in this business doing great things that we got to find ways to keep them engaged and active and, and growing their careers because the last thing we want to do is lose them. Yeah. We're lucky that way. Yeah. And part of that, of course, is keeping them challenged, right? Right. Oh, yeah. They want to be challenged and almost universally they want to they want to make a difference in the business. That's what most of the people that we talk to uh, in these circumstances, they just want to make a difference. They want to know that what they're doing is helping the business. Yeah. And that's awesome. Man, what a great goal. And, and it's up to us to figure out how to accommodate that. Yeah, that's really awesome. David, well, as I mean, I, I already knew this, but you're obviously you've just proven once again that you're doing a lot of things right. We're trying. <laughs> so if you have any other parting words, now would be a good time to do them. I can't think of anything, Brendan. I sure appreciate the opportunity to talk with you. Cool. So I'm going to wrap it up here. Thanks so much again for the chat today. It was great to catch up. Did you enjoy this episode? Find more at RevOpsChampions.com.